So I have adjusted my title a little bit. It started out exploring scale in natural resource management, and then I started thinking about it. I'm pretty much just talk about rangelands, so we'll change the title. No skin off your back, I'm sure. So as Sean mentioned, I did get my bachelor's degree here in 2005. And I'm kind of taking a weird approach to this presentation in that in 2001, I took a class from Dorset Graves. Dorset Graves is the guy who this speaker series is actually named after. And in Dorset Graves' class, in his syllabus, was a stipulation that said, if you missed the day before or the day after a break, you had to give a 15-minute presentation to the class. Um, and being a freshman, I didn't read the syllabus. And being a freshman, I bailed the day before Thanksgiving. So I got back to after Thanksgiving break, and here is Dr. Graves with his list of people who didn't show up for class and are assigned topics for our 15-minute presentations. And at that point in my career, I liked public speaking just a shade less than I like public speaking now. And so I was terrified, just absolutely terrified. And all my other classmates, including my roommate, came up with some excuse on why they missed class. And I couldn't come up with a reason. Couldn't think of a reason why I missed the day before Thanksgiving, other than I just didn't want to be in Shadron on a Wednesday. That's the best I could come up with. So I was assigned my topic, assigned my date, and my date gets closer and closer, and everybody else, everybody who was assigned a 15-minute presentation in that class came up with some excuse not to give this presentation. So it's a freshman class, 60 students. I'm the only one that doesn't tell Dr. Graves that I have a good excuse. In fact, my roommate at the time told Dr. Graves that his sister had a baby, and so he had to leave. He didn't even have a sister. <laughs> let alone have a sister that had a baby, but he got out of the presentation. I didn't. And so the day comes for my presentation. I'm supposed to give 15 minutes, and it's day you know, before PowerPoint and all that fun stuff, and I'm just terrified. Sitting in the back of the room, shaking over my note cards, sweating all over my note cards. They're getting you know, all the pencils running together. And Dr. Graves goes on with his normal lecture, and he goes on and he goes on. And there's about 20 minutes left in the class, and I'm thinking, ah, oh, here it comes. Time for me to wet myself in front of my peers. and <laughs> It's just going to be horrible. I'm just terrified. But then he pauses, and then he keeps talking. And he keeps talking. There's only 15 minutes left in the class. And then all of a sudden, there's only five minutes left in the class. And he goes, oh, shoot. Mr. Prelinsky was going to give us a presentation today, and I completely forgot. So I think what it was is he saw me in the back of the room so absolutely terrified that he just decided he would be better served to continue talking. But anyway, in my approach to this, I've kind of viewed this as a 13-year overdue presentation I, that I owe for Dr. Graves. So, but that being said, so what we're going to talk about today is spatial scale and rangeland management. And so when we, I start with this picture from the Santa Rita Experimental Range down in Tucson, Arizona, or south of Tucson, Arizona. And it's a good example of scale. Because when we talk about scale, we talk about spatial scale and spatial patterns, but we also talk about temporal scale and temporal patterns. So for those of you who can see it, first picture on the left is in 1902 when the U.S. Forest Service took over the Santa Rita Experimental Range. At that point, stuff was pretty well overgrazed. In fact, overgrazed to the point where if you squint real hard, that might be grass there, but I'm pretty sure it's just bare soil. 49 years later, Stuff's starting to come back. You can see the grass in there. The cactus have come back. We don't have the stomping effect and breaking off the cactus. And a few mesquite trees back in the background there. And you jump all the way up to 2003, so a century plus a year. And now we have what looks like far less grass, but we also have mesquite trees in the background. Now, a couple things to preface that is, one, 2003 is a rather nasty drought year in the south. So that can kind of explain the lack of grass. But what's really interesting is that transition to the mesquite trees in the back. That site's transitioning over that century to a mesquite forest almost, which is extremely interesting if you think about the way ecosystems change over time. And that's partially what we're going to talk about today, is how those ecosystems change. So spatial scale. When we're talking about spatial scale, we're talking about temporal scale, we're talking about something that is absolutely fundamental to our understanding of ecology and fundamental to our understanding of rangeland ecology and rangeland management. So we have to have a grasp on scale if we're going to understand how these processes are interacting in our ecosystem. 
I'll talk about spatial scale and I'll talk about temporal scale. Spatial scale is the smallest measure or the smallest measurement you're making in your observations, right? So for an example, we take this table here, right? Nice and solid. You cannot stick your finger through that table at the scale we're looking at it, right? It's solid, you can set your beer on it, it's not gonna fall through. Now, you move into the ultra fine scale. You zoom way in to now you're dealing with atoms and molecules. And at that ultra fine scale, that table is a lot of empty space. There's a lot of empty space between those atoms and between those molecules. So our observation, our scale of observation, how we look at whatever we're observing, that scale is gonna dictate how we see that and it's gonna dictate the processes that are going on. We can think about temporal scale the same way. If I come in, I have Thursdays off, I have no class, I have no office hours, and so if I wanted to spend my Thursday sitting at this table and every five minutes measuring the thickness of that table, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't change. It might, there's a 0.001% chance it might, but in reality it'll probably stay the same. And I can measure it every five minutes for the next year and it's still not gonna change. But if I measure that table and the thickness of that table tomorrow, and I come back in 100 years and measure it, I won't, but someone might, come back in 100 years and measure it, it might be a little different. And then they come back in 200 years and 300 years over wear and tear, that table's going to change in its dimensions. And that scale of our, or the temporal scale of observation is gonna play a huge role in how we observe that table, right? If we only take one measurement every 100 years, we're gonna think that table's changing. If we take measurements every five minutes, we're gonna think that table's not. Both are equally correct. So from spatial scale, and so changing things over time and changing how processes interact over space, we get this idea of hierarchical theory or hierarchy theory. And basically what hierarchy theory does is that lets us explain the changes due to changes in scale. So why is something happening at scale A and not happening at scale B? Or why are we not observing it over one year time steps or two year time steps, but we're seeing it over 10 year time steps. And so we have to think about that when we start observing processes within an ecosystem. If we don't think about it, we have a potential to misinterpret things. Right. So when we start talking about rangeland management, the idea of the site is really key. Right. We've always had this idea of the site. One reason is, is being humans, we like to put things into night neat packages so we can understand them easier. So in rangelands, we do just that. We break very complex ecosystems up. Rangelands are extremely heterogeneous. There is a lot of variability in rangelands. So we break them down into smaller and smaller sites until we can capture a quantifiable amount of variability so we can understand what's going on there. Right? And so over the history of range management, which started a long time ago, we didn't call it range management, but it's been going on for a long time. We've evolved through different site concepts all the way up to this idea of ecological sites. And so we'll spend a lot of time today talking about ecological sites and ecological site scale processes. So we talk about an ecological site specifically, and the ecological sites are the, basal, the basic unit for land management right now. They're the accepted spatial unit by pretty much everybody who works in range management right now, okay? So a distinct kind of land. So we have a unit of land, and it has a specific set of characteristics, so abiotic and biotic characteristics that differ from stuff next to it. Being different, it produces a different kind of vegetation and a different amount of vegetation. So now we have different kinds and classes of vegetation, and we're grouping that across the landscape based on the physical features. Right? What is key then in range management is that those same ecological sites that produce that same different type and amount of vegetation are gonna respond differently to management. Ecological site A is going to respond differently than ecological site B to whatever management plan you throw at it. So we have to understand at the ecological site scale how we're impacting the ecosystem at a larger scale. So where are we? Josh, you wanna throw me a pencil, gently? Thank you. Okay, so where are we when we think about how big are ecological sites or where do they fit in this hierarchical classification? So we can start at the very bottom down there at the XY, just the point scale. This tile, 
the meter we're studying, whatever that point scale is. And we can work up to the soil pedon. And the soil pedon, we have an area about 10 square meters at the surface all the way down to capture the characteristics of that soil. Move up scale a little bit and we have soil series and soils components. And we go up a little bit higher in scale, so about one to 24,000, okay? That's where our ecological sites fit. These are our detailed soils maps and ecological sites fit right about there, okay? We go up higher and higher and higher, we lose less and less detail as we go up there, right? So our ecological sites fit in right down here in our detailed soils maps where we have enough variability that can inform our management decisions, but not so much detail that important stuff gets lost or not enough to where we can't make informed decisions. So this evolution of sites within range management. For a long time, the idea of range sites dominated range management. In fact, up until last year, range judging in Nebraska included range sites. Even though about 1990, we saw this shift. We started to learn that Clemencian succession doesn't work on rangelands, and range sites have Clemencian succession at their central model. So why would we be grouping our landscape into a spatial unit that the model explaining its change doesn't work? So we changed, right? Thanks to Westoby and Lockwood and a whole bunch of other people about 1989, we get this idea of state and transition models or alternative stable states within an ecological site. So within our unit of land, our distinct type of land, our distinct type of vegetation, we have a model that can explain the changes within that. And that's the purpose of our change away from range sites. So if we think about the range condition model or the Clemencian succession model, which drove range management for 50 years or more. Right? In fact, you still see range sites mapped in places across the country, even though we're kind of giving up on them. Now, Clemencian succession basically says you have a plant community represented by our ball, and that ball's gonna move up and down that line in response to grazing and drought. More grazing, more drought. You move to, would be your left, no grazing, no drought. You're gonna move towards your climax plant community. Now, our range sites are classified based on that climax plant community. Okay, so that's important. We talk about a climax community, this is our sweet, ideal suite of vegetation that's going to function at the highest for that ecosystem, okay? But, and some of you who've spent time working in rangelands or a lot of time outside can start to see some of the problems here, right? There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in rangelands that isn't included in this model, right? Invasive species, fire, right? Fun stuff like that. So we change. We add some bumps in the road, right? So, what we have is we create alternative stable states. So our same community represented by our ball there can roll back and forth in that little cup. And it's happy there. But something happens, something changes drastic enough, severe drought, repeat overgrazing or continued overgrazing, something, invasion of layman's love grass or cheat grass or something, pushes that ball all the way up to the peak of that curve and it rolls into the next cup. It crosses that threshold represented by the dotted line. And now it's going to stay there until something, usually a manager, provides enough energy to roll that ball back up the hill and back into the other state. Otherwise, it's gonna stay right there and it's gonna have that structure for that ecosystem and that function. Right? So if we look at the picture way back from the first slide and we had that overgrazed state, that might be our cup on the left. Over enough time and enough changes, right, that ball rolled up to the peak and over to the edge Right? And now it's gonna float around in that other cup until something else happens. Right? Maybe a new species comes in. That's what happened to a lot of the Santa Rita experimental range. Maybe a catastrophic wildfire resets things so bad that you're not gonna get back. Right? But we're gonna stay within those. And it's this alternative stable plant communities and that's what's our central model to this idea of ecological sites and the basic spatial unit for rangelands and for rangeland management. So another way we can look at that is a state and transition model, a true state and transition model. This is just a far more complicated and far more confusing version of that same ball and cup model. Right? The big squares on the outside right, represent our cups. That's where our ball's gonna roll back and forth within that state until something 
pushes it out. Something changes the structure or the function of that ecosystem to cause it to transition to another state. So if we think to the picture at the beginning, that site probably should have been a mixed grass or a mid-grass grassland system. But due to overgrazing and some other drivers, drought and whatnot, it's actually by 2003 transitioned away from the mesquite annual community in the middle all the way up there to a mesquite natives. And that's where it's gonna stay until something happens to push it out. Right? One thing that's lacking from our state and transition models, and it's central to our idea and central to the theme tonight, is this idea of temporal scale. How long does it take to get from our native mixed grass community in the top left to our mesquite community in the right? You don't know, right? Now, we're using ecological sites and we're using state and transition models as our basic spatial unit, and we're deciding management decisions by government agencies, funding agencies, based on these models. But we have no idea how long it takes until a clever young man by the name of Perlinsky comes along and slaps a temporal scale on this thing. And that's chapter one of my dissertation. So what we found using that same 101 year data set from the Santa Rita Experimental Range. We have a lot of data, and so we can track a lot of change using some rather complex math and stuff I didn't want to talk about tonight because I'd have nine of you asleep tonight. <laughs> we can show that to go from either our mixed grass or mid grass step over to either a mesquite native state or what happens the most frequently is down to this mesquite layman state, it happened almost exactly at six years post-invasion. They record, laymen show up in the data set. Six years later, we've transitioned to 40 to 70% composition by layman's lovegrass. And now we can start to slap a temporal scale on this, right? So when someone picks up this model, we now know that as soon as they see layman's lovegrass on this ecological site, if you don't do something, change management, to get it out of that site in six years, you're going to change. You're going to change the mesquite layman state. You're going to change the structure. You're going to change the function of that ecosystem. Alternatively, we had other sites that were in the mesquite native state. And during the 50s, they did shrub control a little bit different. They went around and cut off stumps and then poured diesel fuel around the area to make sure that there was pretty well nothing growing back. Which you would think, if we get rid of all the mesquite but leave all the natives, we should transition back to a grassland system, right? Not quite. That mesquite native state is an extremely resilient state. And in fact, what my data showed is that after 10 years, you are right back to that mesquite, mesquite native state, almost like clockwork, which was pretty interesting. So we can start to stick spatial scales to these models, or excuse me, temporal scales to these spatial models. Interesting, but not really what we all, what we really want to get at tonight. So let's think about ecological sites. We have a nice landscape picture here from southeast Wyoming, and we have a whole bunch of stuff going on, right? So we have, if I'm looking at it, I can say one, two, three, maybe five different ecological sites in that picture because there's different things going on that are gonna determine what plant communities are found there. So we have the climate. Climate is huge in this, e in this watershed and in this ecosystem. A lot of the change is driven by snow and not so much the amount of snow because it gets plenty. It's around or just shy of 10,000 feet. It gets plenty of snow. It's the redistribution of snow. Where does that snow end up, right? When the wind blows, it moves snow from here and it puts it over there. And when it accumulates over there, you tend to get things like aspen groves. And then we have the topography. We have this nice sub-irrigated ecological site in the middle. And the reason we have that is because a lot of the water that shows up on the uplands <coughs> infiltrates, percolates, and then moves laterally into that sub-irrigated meadow. Right? The soils, soils are huge. One of the reasons our water can percolate into our sub-irrigated meadow is the fact that we have very coarse textured soils, rapid infiltration, rapid lateral flow. It's driving what can be found where, what type and amount of vegetation. And then, <coughs> excuse me. And then we have the plants and biota. So we know that all this other stuff comes together to 
force the plant community, but then we have other things like wildlife or grazing animals, soil biota, that are gonna help or hinder what plants can be found there. Oops. So, this idea of the hierarchical, hierarchical theory and this idea of ecological sites. So, central to hierarchical theory, especially in rangeland management, and the reason we have the site concept is that these are repeatable. If you have the same suite of climate, soils, and biota, and topography, you're gonna hopefully, you're supposed to end up with the same ecological site. And that makes it repeatable across the landscape, and that lets us make some management decisions based on what's there. Now, ecological sites are just one level within this hierarchy, right? and not really the exciting level. They're just the one that's central to range management right now. Okay? And they're adopted by, and the reason they're worth talking about is because the Forest Service, the BLM, the BIA, the NRCS, they all use ecological sites and state and transition models to drive their management. So you move into the semi-arid west and the arid west of the United States where almost everything is public land, ecological sites and state and transition models are driving a lot of management in the western half of this country. Fairly important, right? We can look at them on campus. This is the backyard on campus over here. And we have one, two, three, four, five different ecological sites between the water tower and Briggs Pond. <coughs> now, we can look at that. If you go out there and wander around Sea Hill, you can see different amounts of vegetation, different types of vegetation based on about where those boundaries are. The conversation is worth having though, is those of pretty much everyone here has walked around Sea Hill at one point or another. We know, especially if you've been up by the water tower, that right down here in this draw doesn't necessarily look like the site up there. So even at the ecological site scale, we still have some variability in there, right? There's the opportunity to zoom in to go at a finer scale. We might not capture all the variability of that site, but as we zoom in and we look at a different scale, we're gonna see different ecosystem processes. We're gonna see different structure. We're gonna see different function based on our scale of observation. Right? Now, this is the exciting part, at least the, maybe not exciting, there's no explosions. I'm not gonna light anything on fire. But the interesting part's probably a better way to say this. Really interesting to me, at least, is that as you change spatial scale, so if you go from the plant scale on the right to the watershed scale on the left, the stuff that's important at the plant scale doesn't even show up on the radar when you go to the watershed scale. Right? We all took science when we were in elementary school and we all learned the water cycle. Right? Everyone can remember the water cycle. Well, we have a water cycle at the plant scale and that at the plant scale, run off and run on relationships, so water upslope of our plant moving onto it is very important because it distributes nutrients and it distributes water into that plant and can benefit it versus stuff that runs off is no use to that plant at all. And stuff that ends up as deep drainage so it moves down below our bee horizon and below our root zone doesn't matter to the plant either. Right? Now we go to the watershed scale so we measure at the plant scale, we see runoff is very important. We go to the watershed scale and it doesn't even show up. Runoff doesn't play a role. Direct surface runoff is not that important, at least in our rangeland watersheds. Sure, it's important at the small scale because we worry about erosion and stuff, but when we start worrying about watershed output, surface runoff just doesn't show up. It's not important. So understanding where we are what scale of our observation is key if we're gonna understand what processes are important to whatever we're interested in, whatever, whatever part of the ecosystem we're studying. Right. So, yeah, I should read that. We're gonna talk about a couple plots that are located here and this watershed here. Right. Now, also worth noting, as you change the scale of those watersheds, so if you look at those small sub-watersheds within the larger ones, those are going to have a very different behavior compared to the larger ones. There's different amounts of variability. Just size alone is going to dictate how those watersheds function. Right? As we go smaller and smaller scale, we get down to these really tiny guys, and even within those, all of a sudden, maybe surface 
processes become a little bit more important. Not driving, not huge, but at least they show up on the hydrograph. So, a lot going on here. Let's start on the top right. Top right, we're looking at the plant scale. So what we've done here is we have 12 square meter plots and one PBR can for scale, of course. And what we've done is we've wetted that plot up with a, basically a pipe with holes in it at the top with a known application rate. And we let water run on that until we got runoff all the way to the bottom. Lesson number one I learned. On these very deep sites, you have to put a lot of water on to get runoff all the way to the bottom. We put on, and I can't remember the rate off the top of my head, but we let water run on the top of that plot for about, what, 18 hours, Paula? It was about constant to finally get water trickling, trickling out through the flume at the bottom. Okay. So once we finally got to that, the next day, because I was tired and didn't want to do it at night, we start our sprinkler back up and we run a line of fluorescent dye across the top. And that's why you see the green there. And what we can see is that across that plot, there's only a few areas where our water is actually accumulating. In fact, what's happening is runoff is very important to these patches downslope of those bright green puddles. And above that, runoff is very important because all the water that's running off from the top is accumulating in these bright green puddles, and that's where it's actually infiltrated. But we still had next to zero runoff. Even after pouring gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of water on this, we couldn't get a lot of runoff. Now there's solutions to this problem by using things like rainfall simulators or different methods, but this is what we had to work with and this is what we were trying. Right? That's how science works. You try new things. Sometimes they blow up in your face. Sometimes you have a breakthrough. Right? Eureka moments. So that's at the plot scale. We move over to the hydrograph on the left. So this is a rainfall event from July 7th in 2011. In fact, a sizable rainfall event. So we have our rainfall rate on the right side, and we approached almost 250 millimeters per hour at some instances in this rainfall event very hard downpour, right? And it's very, you know, fairly short-lived. The rain lasted about half hour. Rained really hard for a half hour. And in that process, on a plot, that particular plot and one other one right next to it, we see runoff starting about the time we hit that high intensity rainfall and then trickling off. So what we have is at the plot scale, Hortonian overland flow, where it rains so hard and so fast that the soil can't let it in, and so it runs off. And that's exactly what we have here. And then once rain stops, it pretty well trickles on and we're done. And that's the plot scale. On the bottom, we're looking at the watershed scale, that watershed I kind of circled. The black line is the start of rainfall. At the watershed scale, at the start of rainfall, we see a little bit of an uptick. And that's direct fall into our stream channel, causing that little bit of uptick. But then you go, and now at the bottom, the temporal scale on this is about five hours per block, right? Because we had to get to the next day before we actually see the uptick due to this storm. We don't see a peak in our watershed runoff until almost 20 hours later. So we have runoff instantly at the plot scale. Surface processes absolutely dominating what's going on. We move to the watershed scale and the surface processes are limited to just what falls directly in the riparian area or directly in the stream, but all that other water that falls over this watershed doesn't show up for another almost day. Right? So the processes that drive the response as we change our spatial scale are huge. Another way we can look at this is thinking about our temporal scale on the x-axis, our spatial scale on the y-axis, and they're kind of hard to read, but if we go down to the far left corner there, we have our convective thunderstorms, right? very small scale. Anyone who's driven to Rapid City in the summertime and looked back towards Whitney and seen those nice dark sheets of rain coming down can tell they're not over a big area. Right? Our spatial scale of those thunderstorms is very small and our temporal scale is very small. Right? They only last minutes to hours occasionally. Right? As we change our scale, so we go up to 
our watershed scale and our catchment scale, we go from day to seasonal changes, right? So we're dealing with our mesoscale watersheds. Daily time steps, hourly time steps, but that's about it. Right? And then we get bigger. So again, we get to our basin scale and our time scales get longer and longer, seasonal scales, annual scales. And then we get to really interesting stuff like global climate change and we deal with decadal scale. Right? So we have to have an understanding about where we're at spatially and where we're at temporally if we're gonna understand what's really important. Right? We don't wanna be the bonehead representative that brought the snowball in to explain global warming. Right? We're talking about spatially Washington DC and temporally one day to explain a phenomenon that's global in size and beyond decadal temporally. Right? We have to understand what scale we're looking at if we're going to understand the processes that are important. So why do we worry about it in range management? Up until about the 1950s, range management focused on food and fiber. Most of the research done in range management, we were trying to put as much grass into cows and as much cow into the freezer. The 70s, we have a shift. We start to become ecosystem-minded. We start to think about ecosystem processes. Right? And we start to recognize that there's a whole bunch of rangeland out there. Right? 60 to 75% of the terrestrial systems are rangeland. So spatially, they're huge. Right? They can have an impact. Right? So in the 70s, we get this shift. Right? So we start thinking about ecosystem processes, and then we start to throw in the really new kind of buzzword term, this idea of ecosystem services. So what do we get from rangelands other than food and fiber? Clean air, clean water, carbon storage, aesthetic values, recreational values, right? All this stuff, and we start to pay attention to all this other stuff that's going on, and if we do that, then we have to start paying attention to the actual ecosystem processes that are being driven, right? Or that are driving these other uses for rangelands. So we have to think about what's going on at the larger scale, at the ecosystem scale. And so we start to see that, but we're still struggling with that. One of the reasons we still struggle with that is the fact that ecosystem processes don't tend to agree with property boundaries, right? or state boundaries. You can ask Kansas all about watershed processes and they'll say, well, give me your 1.5 million and then I'll tell you about it, right? or whatever they suit us for. Right. So that you've, some of you have probably heard the ideas if we were gonna redraw the western states, we should have followed watershed boundaries. Partially because of this idea of spatial scale and what's really important in semi-arid rangelands. Cool. So we can think about if we want to think global scale and the fact that we have 70% of our terrestrial ecosystems are in rangelands, and we start thinking about big picture things like carbon storage and global climate change and the role that range management has potential to play, the impacts are huge, right? Are there any questions? I only went five minutes longer than I was supposed to. That same watershed, um, that's actually a mountain bike trail. Um, if we want to think of human impacts in watersheds, in, in that particular watershed, they route a whole bunch of water off slope thanks to an immense amount of mountain bike traffic. And so if you get there at the right time, you can take gorgeous pictures of human impacts. So, and there's. Looking at the vegetation and stuff, there's a pretty high likelihood there's still a residual snowbank upslope of that providing water to run through that. Yes? So you're very, you know, our question you're going to ask because you're very adept at explaining this more and more adept than my question. I, um, I like this, uh, this difference between weather and climate, right? This is what the climate and Irish says. But for your notion of scale here in management, to manage it 
in it is a is a small temporal scale and also a small spatial scale because you're dealing with one ecosystem and, and one management agency mm -hmm. at this time who are making decisions on this area. So how do you how do you square that with trying to understand the, the, the global consequences of that of, of man's um, intervention in in this? How, how does one know what sort of long scale ramifications there will be? So the short answer is is we can make educated guesses with our models. Right. So we have climate models. Um, a lot of people like to throw them under the bus, but they're really the best we got. Right. And we can adjust them. Right. We can tweak our models to fit the data that we have as we go forward. And then we can start playing around with those models and changing things. Well, what if, let's say, the desert southwest never really been an ecosystem that's going to stick a lot of carbon into the soil anyway, but gets a little bit drier, which it's predicted to do. So that means it gets a little bit drier, you get a little bit less vegetation production, you get a little bit less photosynthesis, less carbon being pushed down into the plant roots and a little bit less carbon put into the soil where it's stuck for a while. Right? So we can look at ecosystem level changes. We can look at the desert southwest, we can look at the northern mixed grass prairie, we can look at the tall, well, what's left of the tall grass prairie. But to point and say we can fix all of this with rangelands is not possible. It has to be a very adaptive, very integrative approach. We have to pair it with changes in traditional ag. We have to pair it with changes in our carbon outputs and all that fun stuff. Kind of like whack-a-mole, You can, yeah. yeah. And I guess from a range management perspective, we can do the best that we can, right? And that's really what we, it's all we can do. Are there projections then, say that southwest landscape by uh, Tucson, are there projections of what that might look like, uh, weighing a number of variables that might show up in, say, 50 years? Shrublands. Okay. So we, there's work out there that shows elevated levels of carbon in the atmosphere, and an increasing aridity is going to push that ecosystem to a mesquite and shrub-dominated system. Right. There's Elevated carbon is going to benefit some plants. It's going to benefit our warm season plants. It's going to benefit our shrub species. Having that carbon is not going to hurt them one bit. It's the changes in being a little bit warmer is going to benefit some plants too. It, you know, in a century, if our mean temperature is up high enough, there's going to be places where we now have plants growing, right? where we don't have as much production. But we're still going to see other areas where we're going to lose production. Right? So we're still going to lose carbon going into the soil. We're still going to lose that storage as we see large scale shifts in our vegetation. Right? So if we think about a grassland soils, and we think about what used to be tall grass prairie and those dark soils that were black because of all the carbon that was stored there. And we compare that to a soil underneath a shrubland, light in color, leached out, not having that black carbon coating that soil. Right? So if we shift from a grassland to a shrubland, we have potential to not pull as much carbon into that soil. And the desert grasslands, they were a, a quick casualty of the Spaniards. So they weren't an ecosystem that dealt with grazing at all. They didn't evolve with grazing. So when the Spaniards showed up with giant flocks of sheep and a whole bunch of other livestock, a lot of them got pretty well overgrazed in a hurry. So the mesquite's not a natural situation? That's it's a native, okay. but it was for a while contained to smaller pockets, kind of like our ponderosa forest around here used to be much smaller in scale. Changes in management, changes in fire regimes, we tend to get more mesquite invading in areas. Once it gets in there, you see that transition to a mesquite-dominated system, and it's pretty well there. Yes? Is there an organization throughout the world where we are all working on better rangeland management? Yes. Society for Range Management. It's an international society. We meet every year, take students to it. It's interesting. So we have a Nebraska section. So and that's their goal is to increase or improve range management across the globe. <laughs>
Yes. And the goal of range line management is to um, continue to increase the food production, or is it to return things back to native? So as we make that shift away from just food and fiber and start thinking about ecosystem processes, there's been a shift within the society. If you go back to the early papers from the Society for Range Management, they're all about planting forage grasses, taking crested wheatgrass and planting it in the, sage, in the Great Basin in Wyoming to increase forage production to make more pounds of beef. There's been that shift now we think about ecosystem processes. Well, if we put crested wheatgrass into the Great Basin, all of a sudden we change fire regimes, we change responses of that entire system, we change the structure and function, and then we worry about things like sage grouse disappearing. So there's been a shift away from just food and fiber. Now it's a much more sustainable rangelands, keep them as rangelands, right? We're, we lose a pile of rangelands every year. We lose it to urbanization, we lose, lose it to farming. To, so once it's cultivated, we lose some of that function of that ecosystem. So it's a sustainable thing, keeping it in rangelands, keeping it in as close to native plant communities as we can. But if, I guess my question is, is, this, is the goal of that for just enjoyment or eventually to be able to have that be grazed in a sustainable way? To be grazed in a sustainable way. Most of our semi-arid systems and our, air, well not so much our arid systems, our semi-arid systems and our grassland system, if you take grazing out, they evolved with such a degree of grazing with bison and elk and pronghorn and all that other fun stuff. If you take grazing out of the equation, you actually see detrimental effects to these ecosystems. Some level of disturbance is important. Right, so we can use livestock as a management tool to actually keep those as functioning grassland systems. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, guys.